Hey there, fellow rubes, I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. And let me just say, when it comes to the Song of Morden, if you look at the second passage, third paragraph, second line, do the translation yourself, this history goes back further. I'm not saying it was Lolf, but it was Lolf, okay? So we're gonna talk about deep history on WebDM. <laughs> Big news, y'all. This episode is brought to you by Monty Cook Games. They're bringing The Weird of Numenera, one of our favorite RPGs, to 5e with Arcana of the Ancients. This hardcover is going to have new adventure modules, creatures, magic items, PC abilities, and more to make it easy to put mysterious science fantasy into any D&D game. Monty Cook Games has one of the best teams in the business. Monty, Sean, and Bruce have each worked on so many amazing titles. D&D, Planescape, The Psionics Handbook, Return to the Temple of Elemental Evil, you know, just to name a few. We know this book is gonna be awesome. The Kickstarter just started yesterday. The link to it is here and in the description. Check it out. All right, Jim, let's talk about time. And not just time as an abstract, time is a real thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not deep, a flat circle here. Not a flat circle, yeah. but deep time. In your world, how do you come up with and have come across to your players the idea of deep history, mm -hmm, of history mm -hmm. so far back? It hides whole civilizations. It, whole civilizations yeah, yeah. exist. Mm -hmm. Where did the Sphinx really come from? That sure, kind of I stuff. Like, who really built the Sphinx? We may never know. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> what what is it, and, and and how do you include it in your game? There's an idea that history is sort of like an, an academic discipline that studies human development right around the time when uh, the development of agriculture and writing and, and sort of civilization. Well, we started to settle down. Digit, that kind of thing, yeah. You know. Deep history, deep time, big history, they're all sort of like these related concepts, is expanding that and saying like, well, this is a very narrow way to look at history, uh, an important one, and there's a lot of detail there to unpack, but like the span of existence covers so much more than just this sliver of a fraction of time that, that represents recorded history, that all of that should be considered part of the historical record from the formation of the universe to the development of all the chemicals that come out of exploding stars that develop into planets and life and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's as much a part of history as what the Mesopotamians were doing 6,000 years ago. Yeah. And so it's taking that concept of your setting your world is more than just the recent history of the kingdoms and the politics and everything else that goes into it, and it is the development of that setting from its existence. Yeah. It's kind of like the opposite of the way that we recommend a lot of world building, which is like what, start from a village and a dungeon thing. and build out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but I mean, you know, this is like, look like, look at your campaign world from the minute it sprung into existence right, to right. current and like how, what can you find that's gonna be relevant for your gaming table? You know, that's what we're, ultimately that's what we're here yeah, for. Yeah, I mean like, how build where did that mountain range come from? Right, you know, was right. it actual like tectonic plates moving together or did some ancient gods battle there? Or know? is it continent scale magic that shaped the rivers and valleys yeah. and contours of the land. Is is that mountain range, you know, like you're saying, a result of a battle, or is it a fallen monster that over eons has accumulated a crust of dirt and, and whatever? But if you dig deep, there's, there's a, Godzilla. Yeah, there's a fossilized yeah. Godzilla or a living Godzilla <laughs> yeah. or something yeah. there, yeah. right? So it's this idea that, that time, when looked at on a, a large enough scale, is mm -hmm. capable of a, a great many things. It's capable of, say, grinding down elemental earth into a magical soil that inhabits your, uh, your world, or uh, it, it's capable of hiding whole civilizations that you know had planar spanning empires and, and magic that, that boggles the mind of current fantasy residents, that kind of thing. This cosmological scale, this, this long time frame that you can mm -hmm. think about, and using that big scale thinking, sort of be like, all right, what can I do for my game with this? Like, how can I make this relevant to my game? This already touches on something that has gotten to me <laughs> in a lot of fantasy settings, which it's like, fantasy settings usually have this huge recorded history, right? Yeah. Like, just take Forgotten Realms. There's like, if you factor it up from like the Dawn Age and all the fighting between the primordials and the dragons and the gods to whatever current year it is, it's like roughly 37,000 years of some kind of history that's knowable or, or you can figure out, and that's just Forgotten Realms. Middle Earth is similar, something like 55 to 60,000 years from when, I don't know, the first age ended to the current one or something. And, and then even then, Tolkien's like, well, it could also be like billions of years old because it's supposed to be a secret history of Earth. So we're already dealing in the fantasy world with 
improbably long histories. Our own history on Earth that we are aware of, at least the history of human development, is only like five, six thousand years, maybe, right? Like, yeah, not since, that long. Yeah, since, uh, <laughs> since the Sumerians were speaking in Babel language. Right, yeah. You know. it, right. And, <laughs> at and, least and, the first one, right? Right, and writing on clay tablets and sort of starting to settle down. But we also know that if you go back far enough in the archaeological record that there are markers of civilization before writing that people found. The development of fire, indoor plumbing, agriculture, all kinds mm -hmm. of things. And so these are present in our world. The fantasy setting already has these tremendously long written histories. So then why wouldn't their prehistory be equally as long and filled with all kinds of things that you wouldn't you know, necessarily think to look for? Or you could take a, a, the 37,000 year period in Forgotten Realms and just go, we're just gonna stretch this out. The Dawn Age, which a lot of fantasy settings have, and an, an, an age of unnamed days or something like that. Before they started uh, marking increments of time. Uh, right, or the god of time. The, yeah, the number know, of suns in, mm -hmm. in the sky. And in those cases, it's like, why not just stretch that out and make that millions and millions of years? What the current residents of that world understand to be this mythic time of heroes and whatever is poetic license for, mm -hmm. uh, for how they understand their deep past. So right, that, right. that's kind of like the broad, uh, you know, uh, umbrella well, sort of framework for all this. Those prehistoric civilizations, which they themselves could have had written languages, oh, just sure. lost to time. Just lost you know, to time, yeah. All uh, kinds there, of you know, some cataclysm that heroes didn't stop, right. wiped them out, and yeah. it's another two epochs later mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Yeah. So how do you make those accessible? I mean, you can say that, yes, they exist, right? But yeah. making them accessible in the game world, uh -huh. like uh -huh. what level do you go there? So there's sort of like a background level, right, where you know that there are other uh, you know, prior civilizations to this. And most fantasy settings have this in their in their sort of DNA. It, 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 we import it from our own history and, and the fact that the fall of the Roman Empire, rather the changing of the Roman Empire from an empire to the uh, medieval states that, that came after, has a sort of post-apocalyptic feel and loomed large in our own history at the time. Yeah, right? the Dark Ages, right? Well, sure, right, yeah. <laughs> it sounds like an apocalypse <laughs> to me. They were certainly seen as dark from like the perspective of, say, the Victorians. It's there in the DNA of fantasy. So you mm. already have the concept of like, ancient kingdoms whose ruins we pick over, or that lost empire of high magic that was just like, man, they wrote all these spells that we're, that we're studying now. What you do with this is like, instead of making it this accessible, easy to understand, like, oh, we can like go visit this place and read the things that are there, you bury it much further back. And a lot of the details that would come out through play of like, oh, you found an ancient inscription and used comprehend languages or some other similar magic to decipher this, you know, ancient riddle from Egypt you know, centuries ago that, you know, now it's more like, we don't really know what's in that hill over there. Mm -hmm. But we know that occasionally some sort of effect happens or there's a weird kind of magical uh, something or other that's going on in the region. What we don't know is that millennia ago, even further back than that, this was a highly advanced, uh, say, magical research station or city or something like that with all sorts of powerful and terrible magic that's just been sitting there mm -hmm. underground, decaying. and. Yeah and changing without us knowing about it, and now through the process of time or some other mechanism, it's become accessible to us. To back up a little bit, if you're thinking about it in the background sense, these are things like old monumental architecture that's now like a part of the landscape. And so the people of the setting might not think twice about these weird rock formations that began as artificial structures but have now become something else. Yeah. Or odd magical effects that the people take to be a natural sort of occurrence or creatures that mm -hmm. they're like, oh, well, you know, like we've always known that the steel spined gorilla is, <laughs> you know, found in these mountains. It was like, but not always. You know, there was yeah. a time when that wasn't the case and a bunch of wizards and <laughs> magic users you know, created it, vivamancers and the like. So yeah. th that's kind of one way to do it, where it's all in the background. Uh, you're thinking about the scale of these prior civilizations. They're capable of, of affecting things on a continent-wide uh, scale, if not a planet-wide scale. Um, you know, maybe they had a network of interplanar gateways that they used to keep their civilization intact and to travel, and that's affected things, because yeah. it's like, you know, in our own world, the, the development of land masses and, and biomes and all that other stuff is a process of all of these sort of millions of years of working out of these processes. And I don't know, what if there's magic that circumvents all that or that really disrupts it and makes it so that the natural processes are, are 
completely changed. Mm -hmm. That's the background stuff, right? No, I'm 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 loving thinking of a uh, like an like an ancient uh, like pyramid that's now looks like a mountain, and occasionally it rumbles, mm -hmm. it shakes, and yeah. then some steam comes out. So people are just like, oh, it's just the volcano. Just the volcano. It just never like erupted. That. Yeah. They don't know that it's just a nuclear reactor yeah. that is venting its heat, and it's happening more frequently because the reactor's going critical after <laughs> millions of years <laughs> of disrepair. Right. And it, by the way, that reactor holds close a gate. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Now that now yeah. that gate's going to be open. There's all sorts of things like that, right? Like an understanding that the people in this of the current setting they understand these things to be natural or magical mm -hmm. maybe they don't understand it to be technological if they're even technological in the first place right like right you could try to blur that line between science and technology and magic that that's so fun to play with or you can go 100 percent fantasy and say like no these weren't necessarily technological civilizations but they were capable of things on that scale just through magic. Yeah, their, and they, their magic had been so refined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's like you're keeping this portal closed or this gateway's been guarded and, and uh, you know, whatever magical glyphs that are generating the power to keep this thing going have finally degraded. And mm -hmm. now it's all breaking down <laughs> and we have to deal with it. I love the idea of the, of the spine-back gorilla, the idea yeah. of these leftover creations mm -hmm. since, mm -hmm. you know, in fantasy, it's always like, oh, the gods so, created the right. elves, the gods, like, what if a lot of what is now was created by prior civilizations? Right? right. If you're thinking like on the big scale with your campaign, maybe you do have an idea of the creatures that arose naturally from that world, mm -hmm. even if they're fantastical, right? Yeah. But maybe it's that these prior civilizations, these these other um, you know, prehistoric uh, peoples, that they were able to take some of those, introduce new ones. Maybe they brought in um, you know creatures from other dimensions or other planes and introduced them to this world. Any time you read the monster manual that like, well, I, a wizard did this, you know, like a <laughs> wizard made these owl bears or whatever, substitute that. It yeah. doesn't necessarily have to be like a a pointy-hatted Merlin wizard in an old tower who's just mm -hmm. like brutalizing owls and bears. <laughs> Industrial scale magic that's, that's fulfilling a need in that society for some sort of thing. What if owl bears are just there because it's like at one point millions of years ago people were like, this is what we want as a pet. They just you wanted know? to boop a snoot, <laughs> you know? They were like, oh, owls and bears, just can't get it. But something like that, right? Like, owlbear is a silly example because it's such a silly monster, but it's pretty explicit. They come from wizards. And um, you can take that and, and use that for the monsters in your world if you're using this sort of like these civilizations that were there that we don't, that are kind of inaccessible, of just saying, like, well, this whole category of monsters, maybe like all. Uh, elementals or all aberrations or all mm -hmm. whatever come from this civilization. They yeah. brought them here. Yeah. They are responsible for that. And now these creatures are just here. Maybe, and, and this is sort of like touching on some other stuff about the cosmos, it's like maybe those gods that the elves keep talking about and that claim to exist in some outer realm that they receive worship from, maybe they're not gods. Maybe they're just the last survivors of this civilization that were mm -hmm. able to like uplift themselves and be like unto gods and convince the rest of the whatever that they were leaving behind like you know we're your gods we created you we're we're all good like we're gonna go over here and set up our paradise all of those mythologies about say like coral on lorethane and lolf and, and the founding of the elves for instance is all just a retelling of the events of the end of this civilization that saw a split between several different groups some of which stayed behind devolved a bit or you know whatever into the mortal elves that we know others of them became these gods yeah and you do the same thing with like monsters and the like what are dragons maybe dragons are the pets from this civilization they needed these kinds of uh, creatures for whatever reason you want because they like the look of them they wanted to mm -hmm. use them for war they were I mean, what, you know what used if them that for was, power i was gonna know? say well what if they're just like either power uh, sources or just like, I mean, that was just their cars. They created these things that could fly around. Uh, they're mobile, they're intelligent, uh, yeah. they could defend themselves. Yeah. They're useful out, in, whether it's uh, whether it's firefighters that are like burning stretches <laughs> to prevent bigger fires, things yes. like that. Yeah. I mean, like, if you think about like how you would use like a white white dragon that could come in and breathe mm -hmm. cold. Yeah. Oh no, that's 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 fire engine number twelve. That's fire engine number twelve. Yeah, that's the <laughs> thing that we use to keep you know keeps our food refrigerated. Yeah, uh, like Flintstones it up, but with D and D yeah, monsters. Yeah. D and D, <laughs> but you Flintstones it up with D and D monsters in a highly advanced civilization. <laughs> Now we could just talk about how the Flintstones were a highly advanced prehistoric civilization. Anyway, well, we're not going to do that. I mean, were they were they not <laughs> able to bend <laughs> all these models. creatures? To <laughs> Other mo ways to think about monsters that inhabit this deep time are are the monsters that have uh, either the ability to live forever, so like undead, 
things like that, oh, right? Yeah. We know what happens to a lich when they don't get enough souls. They become a demi-lich. But once they start getting enough souls back in them, they, they become more fully realized yeah, they in get their, their caffeine and they wake up. What about a lich that's, I don't know, <laughs> a quarter of a million years old, right? Like, what about a, a vampire that, uh, you know, is that old? How long can they stick around? Like, mm -hmm. what does it do to their not just the nature of their personalities, but the nature of their undeath, yeah. right? That, is there something about it that changes? They think they're entering the state of like stasis where they can avoid the chaos and change of the outside world, particularly thinking of like liches here, right? Like you can really see why lichdom is appealing for mages because mages have that academic, don't bother me, you know, I want to be shut up in my tower and read my books kind of thing going on. And they're like, well, if I'm just dead and nobody bothers me, like that's going to be the best part of it. What if they still have to deal with all these changes that mm -hmm. don't reveal themselves until you can live for, you know, <laughs> tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not longer years, or exist rather, not live. Maybe it changes your mind, your psyche, maybe the magic that sustains you changes and you have to adapt to that. What if you get fossilized and you're still undead? Like, do you stick around? Does your conscience stick around in mm -hmm. a fossilized body? Um, what does that look like even? Got gargoyles? <laughs> right. Is that yeah. how gargoyles come about? Yeah, yeah, is, that, is it? <laughs> you know, do you just keep looking for more and more permanent homes that yeah. you can put yourself in? Well, just like get an adamantine golem. Yeah. Um, mm. So that's sort of like one thing to kind of think about. Uh, another would be, what is the biological legacy of these past civilizations on the current flora and fauna of the world? Is the fact that bat guano is used to cast fireball, which came first? The need for bat guano or the fireball, right? Like, is it that they wanted to cast these fireballs and it's like, well, we need a material component that's readily available. Why don't we just engineer some of these animals to produce that component for us? Mm -hmm. In a safer In way. In a safer way that's yeah. easily harvested and yeah. we, and we just do that. Now it's just assumed. But the fact that bat guano is used in fireballs is a product of this thing. It's not a product of natural evolution, right? Like, yeah. why would it, <laughs> you yeah. know? They, they, they had them uh, be able to, uh, you know, they get stay out of the way all day. Yeah. They go out in the evening, they eat bugs. Yeah. They help with the agriculture around uh -huh, uh -huh. and then they come back and they poop and guess what we can use that you can usually imagine like a bunch it, of druids and wizards getting together and going all right we need to, <laughs> how do we how do we, do we make this work this. within our our, right. our environment here right <laughs> yes. i mean think about it you know. all kinds of things right troll blood the fact that it heals it could be a legacy of this thing like any fantastical thing that's attached to a monster in a DD world could be a legacy of one of these prior civilizations and you can then use that because once the players discover this secret they discover why it is that this prior civilization created these animals or creatures this way that's mm -hmm. something that the players can then sort of exploit use against their enemies or use to their own advantage. It's one avenue of sort of reaching back into the depths of time to affect what's going on now, but have this sort of secret history of your world that can be satisfying to uncover. Like we've talked about, there's these ancient civilizations, they're using these monsters maybe to create magics oh, yeah, that, yeah. Are, that are never been seen yeah. or haven't been seen in millennia until now. Until now, magics. This, these yes. magics, like whether they are effects, whether they mm -hmm. are actual like items that mm -hmm, can mm -hmm. somehow survive. Yeah. Like how does that how does that permeate your world and how does it leak out and, and get back into the active right, campaign right. world? So I, th I think about it like this, like the, the point of thinking of, of this exercise and sort of thinking and why you would want to use this is because you're looking to see what happens for over a long period of time. <laughs> My first thought there is uh, in D&D, D&D takes its spell inspiration from Jack Vance and the Dying Earth. Yeah. And in that series, magic is a living force. Spells are these uh, cosmic entities almost that a magic user trains their mind to trap and contain and then uh, manifest in our world as magic. Yeah. But very high level uh, casters in Dying Earth can just tap into the cosmic entities that produce those effects in the first place and, and go to their source and say yeah. like, I'm just gonna trap you cosmic being and now you're gonna do whatever I want you to do. If that's our inspiration for it, and I know a lot of people don't care for Vancey and casting, but I find it very evocative, this idea of living magic, that a spell is a living thing. Yeah. And if that's the case, then what about magic that's permanent? What about magic that is sort of like, it lasts until it's dispelled or once it comes into being, it's there. Like, does that change over the course of eons? Mm -hmm. What happens to a spell that's contained in, say, a permanent glyph 
that uh, it has a thousand years or a thousand thousand years or whatever <laughs> to without being activated without being activated just to sit there is like does it take on a mind of its own mm -hmm. does it change does it warp if we go back further enough in time does that permanent magic eventually start to degrade and fossilize and we get something that's like kind of like the fossil fuel but for magic mm -hmm. <laughs> you know like we have, and instead of oil and coal and natural gas it's you know strata of, of powdered magic that can be mined and used mm -hmm. to create other things. Veins of it that, that run deep in the earth. Maybe that's what adamantine is, right? Or mithril or something like that. Yeah. It's, it's solidified magic that uh, over time has created this metal or this substance, metallic-like substance. That's where my mind goes with it. You can then sort of take that idea and then repurpose it. Why would you be mining all these materials? Why would you be digging into the earth to find them? Maybe the sites that you're finding these magical materials that everybody thinks is just sort of like, oh, hey, this is just like, the gods gave this to us, isn't this wonderful? Is actually like a dangerous place. Maybe that's a contaminated site uh, or yes, something like, like that. The, yeah. Like the magical nuclear waste of the prior civilization. Yeah, and yeah, you're yeah. tapping in like, oh, it's all this power. And it's like, yeah, but your, your children are gonna be born with an extra arm. Right, you know, yeah. Start, start to mutate. Or this is how we get tieflings. This is how you get tieflings. They're going to have to start growing wings or horns. Right, you know? that kind of thing, yes. You know. Exactly. Or what if you just don't understand the magic? What if it's like there and, and you're able to find, uh, you know, some fragment of a magical object or, or a piece of it or something? You can maybe produce some effects from it. But, you know, you take, like, say, what was maybe a focusing crystal that, that helped amplify psychic energy or something like that, but it's incredibly durable. Now you've made a Warhammer out of it. What's the <laughs> side effect of the fact that you've made a weapon out of something that was meant for this other function? So repurposed magic, magic that's used for one thing and then for another, mm -hmm. particularly if it's tied to objects or places or something yeah. like that, is another way to utilize these uh, magics from the ancient world. Mm -hmm. Or what if yeah. they're just a piece of a greater thing? Like it's all a magic construct, but you only took the one thingamajig right. that heated the what's it call it yeah 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 exactly. matter what it is yeah. and so you, but you take it off and it produces this magic effect say the rod of seven parts yeah the rod of seven parts is this artifact that in sort of baseline D&D &D, it's created by the wind dukes of, of aqua to help them fight mishka the chaos spider and some other sort of cosmic entities that represent atrophy and corruption and things like that and it's broken into these parts that you then go across the multiverse collecting and can use and like each part has its own powers but when combined with other parts of the rod they get new powers if i'm remembering right like the different combinations of pieces you have and how they fit together can produce different combinations but mm -hmm. i might be just like going wild off my ass on that one uh, <laughs> that's the way it should be <laughs> right it will be when i do it take that idea and say all right these uh, prior worlds had this uh, artifact of some kind technological magical whatever it is broken up we found a piece of it we can kind of coax it to do this through experimentation, but it was really meant for this other function. And as you find more pieces of it, constantly having to relearn how this thing works, what it does, and then maybe the more of it you assemble, the the, the higher price you pay to use the powers uh, that it generates. And that the magic that maybe at one time was safe and, and uh, effective to use is now dangerous. It's now, it's gonna do something to you. It's gonna change you. And it might not be as effective because we're dealing with like prior worlds and civilizations that mastered magic far beyond what's in, say, the player's handbook, it's still going to produce an effect that, um, you know, players might not otherwise have access to. And that just sort of touches on the fact that these civilizations could have been the ones that created the spells in that spellbook in the first place. Mm -hmm. They could have been the first ones to go like, yeah, we, we figured this out. We, we yeah. learned how to do magic, you know. What I'm imagining, uh, <laughs> I've been waiting for this moment, <laughs> is this is when you literally look at your players and you they, they, they've been delving in this dungeon they find this book, mm -hmm. they manage to translate it, and all it says is basic spells for beginning casters. Right. And you hand them the player's handbook, and it's literally exactly as listed in the player's handbook, right. this this book. This and it's like, here. no, the, this book is what survived, <laughs> and some yeah. wizard found it 30,000 yeah. years ago at the establishment of modern magic, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's why these are the spells that you yeah. have, because this is all that made it through. Well, all, coming back to yeah. Dying Earth, is this, it's sort of similar that way. There's yeah. like, these are the hundred spells that have survived, or, or whatever mm -hmm. it is. I really like that, and that, again, ties right into like traditional fantasy lore. There's there's always this like magical civilization that was able to create or master a certain type of magic that's no longer available. Like, why have them be a couple of hundred years ago, put them like millions of years ago, yeah. make them really strange, really bizarre, and then when you stumble across these ruins, like, you can really highlight how strange and weird and bizarre it is 
but then the players also have something new and unique to discover about their world and yeah. like participate in that. Um, yeah, like that's where it really gets fun like, for me. Like the Prometheans in Halo. Sure. Go, go, <laughs> go further back because there's obviously something deeper. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> thinking more cosmic in that sure. regard. Yeah. Uh, take, taking it out a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, what about where did the ancients come from? Were there oh, gods yeah. that invented them? I yeah. mean, like you know, you kind of touched on it earlier that that the ancient civilization, the, the last remnants, might. Sure. Yeah. But what did they worship? Yeah. You know, is yeah, I mean, that even yeah, worth thinking <laughs> about? <laughs> well, I think I think it kind of is. Like, I mean, it's it's at some point you, thinking about like the the deities in your campaign world, how they came about, how, what their relationship to the processes of creation were. You know, were they late on the scene <laughs> and just sort of like like oh yeah, we're totally the gods of this. Place. Place. Yep, you can or, trust us. Yeah, or are they like vastly powerful cosmic entities that are like unto gods that did create this place? Mm -hmm. They were able to come along and take this lifeless rock and transform it into something that could sustain life and not just that, but they mm -hmm. set it up so that it's filled with wonder and magic and fantastical creatures and all of these things that they found from all over. What if the world as it exists in a traditional fantasy world isn't a bad place necessarily, but it's like the product of this uh, civilization that thought bringing all of these creatures and peoples together would be a good thing. Yeah. Maybe they brought them together to save them. Maybe this is like the last inhabitable place in the multiverse because everyone else is yeah. destroyed or, or rendered uh, lifeless. All um, the races of the Federation settling on, on one planet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and the people that were in the past civilization saw like, okay, well, we'll just like, you know, they had a different view on things. And it's only through the, through the workings of time and the breaking down of societies that we get the animosity that we have today in, in a lot of traditional fantasy. So asking yourself, where do the gods come from? Who and what are they? Are they truly gods in the sense of like being omnipotent, omniscient beings within their sphere of influence and they derive their power from worship? Or are they just like really powerful cosmic beings who, you know, can get something out of being worshipped. Well, you might want to just completely say, yeah, they're just <laughs> cosmic beings who are pulling a con job on everybody. Yeah. Um, so you're not saying that they're aliens. You're right, I'm not you're saying, saying they're aliens. Is that they're aliens. Yeah, I am saying <laughs> But for instance, Ao in Forgotten Realms, we we'll right. keep coming back to it because it's sort of a touchstone for everybody, but Ao's whole deal is like, he gets to decide who gets to be a god and who doesn't. Right. But where does Ao come from? Where is where is uh, you know is is uh, you know is he an uncreated creator or is it more of like yeah there's another level of reality above that <laughs> that is a part of this because it's been there all along we're thinking about the origins of things and how they moved and yeah thinking about all that is is fun because there might be implications for your cosmos that you introduce if you use these concepts that if you don't like give it some thought if it comes out in play. One of the players goes like, "Why didn't these gods tell us what was going on for all these millions of years? Or yeah. like, why don't why don't they know? Or why can't they do something about it?" Yeah. You know, well, I think in the end, I think in the end, it's it, it, it comes down to a matter of perspectives, right, and, right. and a god's perspective and a mortal's perspective are two vastly different things. <laughs> very different things. Very and, different things. Uh, one does not really concern itself with the other. Not usually. I think no. we know which direction <laughs> that goes. Now, concerning that though, yes. in that dynamic, uh -huh, uh -huh. the DM they themselves are a manner of god presenting oh, the sure. world to, oh, sure, yeah. to their their mortal players. Uh -huh. So how the hell do you get your players interested yeah. in this deep history? Now? Right, right. How do you make it intriguing for them? Yeah, how do you hook them in with this stuff? Because it, by its nature, a lot of this is inaccessible. Right. These are not civilizations where it was like, oh yeah, a couple hundred years ago they fell, or even a couple of thousand years ago these things fell. It's like these were so far back, no one living knows about them except maybe the Aboliths. Um, and uh, they know all. <laughs> right. But you don't want to necessarily make it so inaccessible that it's not interesting for the players. Right. And so you do like you always do. You use backgrounds. You tie it in. You you let the players know, hey, this is probably going to be a feature of this game, or the fact that there are you know, these advanced civilizations that are in the deep history of this campaign setting, and sort of like have an impact on it. it you know, is one way to do it. Um, you keep everything sort of vague and and mysterious. Maybe the players help you figure out some of the details through play. But let's say you have like a sage or a cloistered scholar or the archaeologist or anthropologist. Those are all backgrounds that can be used to tie in these things into the players. Um, other than that, you've got things that are like NPCs and, and people in their, the characters' lives who might be interested in this or get caught up in it. Mm -hmm. And of course, you can have the discovery of these things sort of feature the players prominently. They're, they're sort of at the center of the uh, rediscovery of these things or, or the catalyst for the rediscovery of them. Then that's one way you can really kind of get the players invested. 
if they're not, then you can sort of like move all of it to the background and then just sort of like every now and then be like, oh yeah, a new discovery came out of this dungeon or this yeah. e excavation or something like that that's produced a new magic or a new spell. And then sometime later you go like, oh yeah, they're already developing new spells based on this ancient stuff that's been found. Mm -hmm. To sort of highlight that, yeah, this is an ongoing feature of the campaign world, it's happening and it has an impact on it. And you know, maybe you weren't, didn't want to be there for the beginning, but now that they got to the good stuff, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you, like most things, it's about communication with your players, learning to read the signals they send to you about what they are interested in doing and, and them also willing to accept what you're interested in doing mm -hmm. and pick it up and run with it. Uh, oh that, yeah. That makes the whole game work, right? Yeah, definitely. Throwing in a non sequitur discovery in the, in, in the vein of their first adventures. Yeah, yeah. You know, just, oh, going down to recover the people that got nabbed by the goblins, but yeah. down there you find this disc. Yeah, and yeah. And because of yeah. it, it's, it spawns like you said, All kinds you know, of stuff. and so, hey, if they want to run with it, great. If not, it's just, you've started that process in the yeah. background and they can come back to it at any time. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. How do you weigh what, uh, how far back you pull that veil? How much do you show of your cards right, to, right, to, right. To, to kind of weigh that, uh, getting them interested versus like just giving them an info dump? That yeah, oh want, God. You know? Yeah, I would avoid info dumps. You yeah. know, I, I would let it be known early on in the campaign, if not in the pregame sort of session zero type stuff, that there are these prior worlds, these other civilizations that have, uh, that have an impact on the campaign world. You don't need to know anything about them. You don't need to be interested in them, whatever. You just need to know that it's a feature of the game world, right. that some place uh, you know, feature either the ruins of them that they don't quite know are ruins and maybe mistake for landscape, or there's an impact in the way that spells work or magic or animals or something. I, I would keep it vague and light, but just let them know it's there. If they're interested in it, once you let it be known, like, hey, this is probably going to be in here, then it's up to them to go like, well, I've made a sage with history and all this other stuff. I mean, a knowledge cleric that, mm -hmm. that wants to explore these things. Like, that's the signal that you're waiting to get back, and that's sort of the go-ahead to you know, start building these things into the campaign world. I would start out by letting them know they're there, but keeping it vague, keeping the mystery alive, waiting for them to show interest before developing it further. And then once they do, it's a matter of getting them information, revealing those secrets that you've uh, built up about your campaign world, but if you don't share them, they're useless. So you want to get those <laughs> secrets into the player's hands. Answering questions like, does a comprehend languages spell work on languages that no one has read in millions of years? That same with like legend lore. This would be one of those things where if a player tried to cast legend lore on one of these things, I'd just make them remember their discovery of it. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like, it has no legend. Everyone who knew about this thing has forgotten about it. You're there creating the new legend for this thing. Yeah. So you can keep the, ma the past mysterious from magic and sort of like not let them get access to it through that type of spell. I know legend lore is higher level than comprehend languages, but, but then they can also s rediscover these Cyclopean ruins. They can learn the language. They might not have a access uh, to the magic. Maybe they find a cipher or a Rosetta Stone or something like that. Have the mystery and have it be vague and weird and, and not quite well defined. And then we are waiting for the players to sort of lead where they want to go in that, what they want to figure out, what they want to discover. And that's where you start filling in the details and finding ways for the players to get access to the secret information that you've made so that they can act on it, use it to their advantage, and just enjoy the, the weirdness of it, you know? Right, right. Yeah. So um, to, 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 to best enjoy that weirdness, sure. what are some concepts that, you can, that players Ooh. can have? Like you said, you've discussed in session zero, this is going to be an aspect of yeah. it. Characters like I want to make a sage. Well, like, what are some what are some of those? Because I yeah. see far travelers being a good. Oh yeah. Like if you you want to do a, a time displaced mm -hmm, mm -hmm. character. Yeah, oh, yeah. Either far travelers good one for stasis that. Stasis chamber or, mm -hmm. or, or some other magic. But they were petrified. They're and petrified. Petrified. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Turned yeah. into stone, and so I was like, oh. You, know. <laughs> you can tie into these ancient civilizations by playing someone from them, and you are time lost and displaced. And mm -hmm. you're now in this, you know, new age, this, this world that is, uh, has come after your height. And you, maybe you're playing a character who's like super depressed about that or, yeah. you know, I, in Land Between Two Rivers, the, the axe dreamer is like that. He was a great hero of a prior age and was mysteriously disappeared and ended up in a Medusa's collection. You yeah. know, in, in a place where erosion would never harm it. And you could really have, as long as it's, uh, you know, geologically stable, and no telling how long that statue will stay there before it's unpetrified. You know, I expressed for him, like, he has a memory loss, he was stoned for a long time. A lot of how I envisioned his personality before and after is different, change. Mm -hmm. And he spent a great deal of time after being awoken thinking he was in a nightmare and or hell. 
and it was basically like, this isn't real, I'm not here, like, I'm going to wake up. And it was only after a long period of time that he was like, no, this is real, like, I'm, this is real, real. This isn't a dream, I'm not in a different place. Um, and sort of like coming to terms with that and realizing like that he's in a vastly different world has been part of the fun of it. And the players have like super latched on to an NPC that was introduced when I stepped away from the table and a guest DM <laughs> filled in <laughs> oh, yeah. to run a one shot and introduce this character. I was like, let's really run with this time lost thing. But you had one in another game, right? Like you had a time lost. We discovered a character of yours like in a stasis field or something. Uh, no, no, it was uh, uh, he was he was uh, actually, and it, it wasn't that that much. It was only like a like few hundred years. But he was a yeah. hero of the dwarves um, who uh, yeah. who basically collapsed his own planet uh, in on itself, a mm -hmm. la Vulcan in the you know oh, Star yeah. Trek, <laughs> uh, to destroy a beholder fleet. Yeah. Right as they're making landfall, he collapses it and destroys an entire <laughs> fleet as the dwarves escape. But he shoots himself off in a, an escape portal. He didn't think it would work. Mm -hmm, and he's like, mm -hmm. well, might as well try. Yeah, yeah. It did work. Yeah. And then over the eon, over hundreds of years, mm -hmm. it collected and became a comet. Right. And y'all were just like, let's just investigate let's that just comet. Let's investigate the comet, yeah. And, and then this you actually, like, there's a spell that y'all had, had created, like, to look for minerals. Like, yes. find mineral, And, like, you found a core of, like, adamantine or some strong metal. Right. And y'all dug him out. And, yeah, it was a dwarf. And, you know, he was a hero that was. they thought that was lost. And they threw you a party. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, you know, the party. check out those ruins. And so, yeah, <laughs> check them out. Maybe there's, like, all kinds of wizards, uh, whatever passes for a wizard in these civilizations that have sealed themselves up in temporal uh, stasis. Now that they're free, are they friends? Are they mm -hmm. foes? Are they going to try to... Like, try to take over? Try mm -hmm. to take over. Uh, you know, what if they're time travelers from this civilization and they're like, oh yeah, well, our civilization fell, we just projected ourselves forward in time. Maybe they do it physically, maybe they do it psychically, the way that, yeah. say, the, the race of Yith do uh, in the mythos. Maybe they uh, do it completely differently. You know, they're not a threat, but they're also, you know, not exactly friendly. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can play one of them. Antagonistic. Uh, <laughs> antagonistic. Yeah. Another that I'm kind of thinking of is like someone from the young civilization, right? The civilization that's inherited this world. Are they pessimistic? Mm -hmm. You know, if they're aware of all these other civilizations that have come before them and the greatness that have come, and maybe they're just kind of like, well, what's the point of doing anything? Like we're, yeah. like we live in the ruins of these other worlds, and we're never going to reach their height. And yeah, like what's like Mad Max? Yeah, right. Like, you why know, would you keep going? Like, why would you keep going? Why not just like wallow in the the misery of it? Yeah. Or you can go the opposite direction and go like, look at this wonderful world we've inhabited, and our our ancestors and the prior worlds that have come before us have gifted us yeah. this wonderful, amazing place with all of this magic in it and all these beautiful things. Like, we can make utopia here, yeah. and and really lean into sort of that kind of thing where you're more optimistic yeah. um, so or you could be uh, conspiratorially mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you, you could create be. that word <laughs> yes <laughs> <Just> be like <laughs> and right then you come back to ancient aliens conspiracy theory mm -hmm. yeah, you know you can it's sort of like where are all these things you know what is all this stuff maybe you found They're hiding something it from us man they are hiding it from you right <laughs> like it, it could be that there is a conspiracy maybe the gods are keeping it from you and they're yes. keeping the truth of the campaign setting uh, from you maybe it's just time and, and there's nothing active that's doing it it's just very old mm -hmm. uh, and and difficult to get in touch with but you could be that crazed scholar that oh, crackpot yeah. conspiracy theorist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, there were aliens. The aliens created the gods. Uh, and of course, all this does is like time travel magic, and which is oh, yeah. to me best hand waved and used as a plot device as opposed to like actual spells and magic and stuff. Just like giving them a glimpse of, of what their past was like it can be really fun. So, right, it's it's a different way to approach world building, and especially with the eye towards like this ancient and, and old and, and like cosmic scale thinking can produce like an adventure I can play in my game next week. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and you've added some level of mystery and unknown to your game um, that could be really, I don't know, just really fun to explore and uh, yeah. check out. Yeah. It's one way to decode the past. There you go. Because that's another way to say cypher. Boom. Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. I can't get that song from I'm trying to shoot a show. John Wick out of my head, the bathhouse no. song. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Love me. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, no, no. I, uh, in my most recent John Wick uh, uh, die. Mm -hmm. I, I had that song on repeat for a couple of days. Yeah, I can. There's see a couple what? songs on that soundtrack, yeah. like uh, the we'll Marilyn we'll Manson "Killing Strangers" song is amazing. Uh -huh. As far as like a dark blues song. Oh yeah. Aren't you glad we watched that, Traff? What? John Wick. I am glad we watched John Wick. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, it reminds me. It has the feeling of like a RoboCop, where it feels like an instant classic. Yeah. Um, I just wish it wasn't. I wish they'd used squibs, I mean, and that's like a minor There's nitpick. A lot of well, I, I'm completely comfortable with that because they just stuck with it, and it was all about the concept itself. And the they, concept they the made the concept There's work under the budget that they had. I was going to say there'd be some of those shots that'd be difficult to do, like where he's like blown off people's it's eyes. Everything with the action that I wish movies like The Dark Knight had done. Yeah, you see not all of so it. So afraid to show the freaking fighting, or not trying to cheat it and cheat it and cheat it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make a fight. Well, it's because they weren't, they didn't fight. rehearse like he did. Yeah, like, right. I mean, it, like, now look up those YouTube videos of him rehearsing, like, the gun. Like, yeah, the right. reason why he can just fucking go through there, throw it out. You know, showing the reloading, doing anti woo action. Yeah. You know, it's okay to show your, your hero reloading. Yeah. Like, that's more realistic. Yeah. Um, I love the. I love. He the. does some shit in John Wick too, though. There's a couple of re there's a there's a reload scene in John Wick too. That's like, there yeah, you go. That's you how go. you step up your game. Yeah, that's how you do that. <laughs> it's right. You ready to do one? Yeah, let's do uh, it. Yeah, let's 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 try it. 